The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. Now he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter told him, took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my world's words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I'll invite the congregation to be seated. Well, grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you in whatever form or medium you are joining us this morning. Well, my name is Jason Fugate, and I wanted to begin this morning with a brief word of gratitude for all of the Wicker Park Lutheran community. Now, I am in my final year of seminary as I continue to train and study in the hope and anticipation of becoming an ordained minister in the ELCA. Now, I have been extended a pastoral residency to serve here at Wicker Park Lutheran Church during the final year of my studies, and I just want to say I am so incredibly grateful. In a time of uncertainty and change, you continue to support others like me outside of your community, and you continue to bring them into the fold. I know that this coming year will be filled with the blessings that God extends to each of us, but again, I just wanted to start by expressing my thanks and my excitement for all that is to come. Well, the last time I preached was several weeks ago while I was on my internship in Omaha, Nebraska, and I shared with the congregation there that I was really excited about the gospel reading, which was from John 6. It was about Simon Peter being asked if he would turn and leave Jesus, as many others were when Jesus was giving a difficult teaching. Well, Simon Peter responded to Jesus, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Well, I noted in that sermon, this is a high moment for Peter in the Scripture, and that there are other times in Scripture where Peter struggles. Well, if we fast forward a few weeks, and for me, a few different states as well, 
And here we are in this moment. It didn't last long before looking at a text in the Bible where Simon Peter is putting his foot in his mouth again. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things, Jesus said to Peter. It's a not-so-nice or polite wake-up call. Jesus confronts Peter over his rebukes regarding the teachings of the great suffering that the Son of Man will come into. Jesus is a teacher, and this lesson is one that comes up in our lives time and time and time again. Where is it that we put our trust? Where is it that we believe power dwells? Do we rely on ourselves and the world, or do we go to Jesus? Now, I think Peter is such a wonderful person to read about in the Bible because he so clearly wrestles with the challenges that we face in our everyday lives. His faith is in Jesus, but he is sinful. He is a human. Outside forces sway him and knock him off course, and he challenges Jesus. Well, Jesus unflinchingly reminds Peter that he is the way. Jesus is the truth. Well, after Jesus confronts Peter, he turns to the crowd and he proclaims that even all of the riches and knowledge of worldly things mean nothing when we face the reality of death. No We must go to Jesus, who extends in his suffering, death, and resurrection, eternal life. Those ways of the world will mean nothing when standing up to the power that Christ has. Peter continues to learn and to struggle just as we do. And he eventually begins the church that has persisted all the way through right up until today and on. Living our lives together through all things is how we can persist in our love for Jesus. And when we fail, we are in a community that models the grace and love that Jesus has for each one of us. We find strength, power, and knowledge in a community that is committed to their faith in Christ. This lesson is an important one, especially as we look at our theme today, which is the season of creation. How can we live into Jesus' challenge to take up the cross and to follow Him. Training our hearts and minds on Christ comes with the consequence of actively letting go of our need for accumulation and excessive consumption. Turning away from that and looking instead, moved by the Holy Spirit, how we can care for our neighbors. Now, the world is happy to teach us different narratives about what this means for us. The locus of who our neighbor is continues to shrink and shrink. First, that locus starts only with humans. And then, as we know and we have seen, this locus shrinks more and more. It limits which humans we can even count as our neighbors. Well, this kind of thinking is necessary to continue our consumption patterns. When we see the devastation that climate change brings to those all over the world, 
Everyone has already become vulnerable to more and more frequent instances of extreme weather. But eyes are still fixed on some future event, something that you would see in a movie. That will really signal that the earth is in distress. Well, the earth cries out to her inhabitants in need and distressed. The inhabitants of earth lose their lives and livelihoods in events of cruel and random chance, subject to tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, and more extreme weather, egged on by indifference to our neighbors who are most vulnerable. It will be never bad enough until the prevailing narrative of this world is no longer insisting that this is the way that it must be. If we learn this lesson that Jesus is teaching Simon Peter to put our trust in him and not in our own understanding or the understanding of the world, we can be more open to lessons from all of those around us, even the lessons the earth is screaming out to us. Now, while many cultures have been intentional about their care for the environment, the academic movement for environmental ethics in the West was pioneered by a professor from Wisconsin. His name is Dr. Aldo Leopold. Well, Leopold writes about the environment that challenges the prevailing narrative in his time and ours. And it continues to influence all conversation about environmental ethics. Well, Leopold argued for the expansion of the view of our communities, not just to the people or the humans that inhabit it, but the animals as well, and also including in that community the land that we reside upon, the soil, the trees, the air, is inseparable from the community. And thus, these things should be treated with the same love and respect we would come to know in a community. The term that he uses for this is the land ethic. Well, Leopold also wanted to make the case that we could never fully understand the ecosystem that we are a part of. That's because we are a part of it, and so we can never fully understand the greater picture. The ramifications of our actions we are not fully aware of. Well, if we come with this knowledge, Leopold suggests we should be extremely cautious and observe carefully the ways in which we use the land around us and how that affects our ecosystems. Well, I think these teachings are in lockstep with what Jesus teaches. The land is not something to conquer or extract, but something to treat with dignity and respect as we are a part of God's creation. This means extending love out to all of those who cry out in need. Taking seriously the needs of the earth and the call that Jesus makes to take up our cross and to follow him, it still leaves us with a little bit of a predicament. What is next? Where is it that we go from here? Faith communities, when practicing the welcome and love that Jesus extends, can be transformational places. They can shift, adapt, and outright change to meet the needs of their neighbor and to call more people into that community. 
Cultivating these places means setting aside the assumptions of the ways of the world and continuing to learn and grow in ways that can transform our community. Rooted in God, nothing is impossible. The kingdom of heaven on earth is no longer something that is unimaginable, something that is a pipe dream. Instead, the kingdom of heaven on earth becomes a hope, a vision, and a goal. Learning and living in harmony with the earth as part of our community. The task may seem impossible, but the burden is not placed squarely on our individual shoulders. Our community can carry much more together than any one of us can carry apart. All of this through the amazing power of the Holy Spirit. When hope for the future feels dim, Remember that instinct of despair comes from within ourselves. It does not come from God. The reading that we heard from Isaiah is an example of when times were grim for the Israelites. This was most likely written during a time when both the kingdoms of Israel and Judah had been conquered by outside empires. The people had become prisoners and slaves, often forced to leave their homeland in fear. These are not the conditions that hope would abound. But the Scripture reminds us that God never gives up on God's people. Isaiah chapter 50, verses 8 and 9 say, He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. So even when devastation is around us and the machine of consumption continues to press on, hope is never lost. That's because the calculus is not of this world. For our Creator and our Protector is present to provide the growth of all of the good that abounds in this world. While you and me may be small scatterers of the seed, God is an amazing gardener who can produce more beautiful and wonderful things than we can even imagine. Do not lose hope in the face of crisis and pain, for God always supports and loves creation. Taking up the cross and following Jesus may mean some form of sacrifice of our comfort, our wealth, or our lifestyles. But these things are nothing for what we gain in Christ Jesus. Now, as I end my sermon, it is a tradition for me to say a prayer. And so, if you will join me now, let us pray together. Dear God, bring us into conversation with all of your creation and remind us that our community is a shared one. Allow us to be humble and learn to hear and react to the needs of all in our community. When we lose hope, assure us of your presence and love. 
lead us out as we seek to scatter seeds of faith. Amen.